Hello and welcome to Calm Versations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's Calm Versant is Candace Jackson, who is a lawyer who is working on Title IX issues in the previous United States presidential administration and is now working on a lawsuit against the state of California for putting males into female prisons. In this conversation, we talk about the law's view on sex, and it's kind of quizzical because the law hasn't defined sex anywhere, and so there's a lot of work to do to actually define sex within the law and align the law to reality, or at least to a particular reality that would allow women to maintain privacy from males. This is a fascinating and a very important conversation. And not only is sex under question, but also a lot of the things that we've been taking as granted within the law and the law's relationship to argument, to debate, to reason and rationality, and of course, reality. I'm very honored to have her on, so without further ado, here is Candace Jackson. You've begun. In earnest, yes, yes, yes. I think it's gonna be a long haul, but um, you gotta start start somewhere with the the legal side of those of us who want to push back on how quickly an entire ideological view of what sex and sex differences mean and should mean has, has really started to take over legally. Mm -hmm. Uh, When did you become aware that that was a possibility or that that was Mm -hmm. in the works? Uh, I mean, there were those of us that, you know, certainly by 2016 and then coming into working inside an administration um, in the federal government by 2017, you know, it was on the radar to some degree. Um, certainly, I, I, I feel like a lot of us did not anticipate just what the juggernaut w- was out there doing. And so there, there just wasn't a concerted enough effort, um, at least that I could see at the federal level, to um, to effectively, tactically start pushing back. Mm -hmm. So how um, we we had a conversation off the record a while ago, and you brought up some very fascinating um, legal realities about sex being defined or ill-defined or not defined in law because it was just taken as granted. Is that, is that the case? And um, (laughs) how did we not, how did we just assume that? Like, was that naive? Oh, (laughs) Uh, it's hard. It's hard to. It's hard to call it um, inexcusable naivete, right? Because it it was something so taken for granted. Um, there there was not. It was it was not anticipated that there was a need to to say what the what sex refers to uh, as a matter of um, the basic, very fundamental differentiation of humans into male or female. I just, that's not spelled out anywhere in us law because it, it wasn't seen as, as being necessary to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even before, even before a gender concept as being something different than male, female sex differentiation came into being, um, you know, even, even something like sexual orientation, Um, You could see legally how a definition of sex and what is intended by a protection against sex discrimination law means that spelling that out would have been a very good idea because even setting aside gender um, being intertwined with sex, if you look at sexual orientation, you started to see some laws not not need to go through the democratic process of debating and deciding whether sexual orientation also needs and deserves non-discrimination protection, you started to see that just be interpreted that way because, well, sexual orientation is related to your sex, your same sex attracted. And obviously that has to take into account what sex you are to begin with. Mm -hmm. So you started to see the interpretation of sex in law already including concepts related to sex, but not sex itself. 
And mm. then it's just one small step. As soon as an ideology catches on, you know, to add another characteristic to that, your belief about your sex and whether you believe yourself to be the sex you were born or to be a different or non-sex. So you just add that. And all of a sudden, all of these concepts are being uh, shoved together in laws that have existed for decades in an attempt to um, correct inequalities between men and women are, are now being stretched to cover what are perceived to be unfairnesses um, that, that cut across completely different demographics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, if we just kind of go a little bit further back, the law, common law, and then what became U.S. law has treated women and men differently. And that's changed over time. But with regards to uh, property, men and women have been legally treated differently within property law. Is that the case? So there has been precedent mm -hmm. for um, just unequal or different treatment mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, the sex of one person. But that was always grant, uh, assumed that we would know in 99.99.99.99% of the cases uh, that men and women uh, are different. Um, mm -hmm. So the move to make the law uh, non-discriminatory or treat men and women equal, do are you able to explain like how that process began um, and then how it's progressed over the ages um, since since that uh, process began. Because I think that there's probably yeah. some conceptual um, arguments that that might have uh, led up to where we are now, or maybe not. Maybe they went off the rails at some point. Well, yeah, there, so, so there has been a real evolution. The, the ways in which the ways in which formal legal treatment differentiated between men and women um, from from the start of of that kind of process um, was just almost entirely hierarchical hi hierarchical where you know males interests and priorities and and privileges and status were certain were, were just placed above um, those of women. Um, so any kind of recognition of a legal different treatment was, I think it pretty objectively to the detriment of, of women, at least by any kind of standard in terms of autonomy, um, public participation, uh, choice and dignity in terms of, um, you know, self-direction as a human being, that kind of thing. Um, so in terms of trying to expand the law's concept or, or even underpinning of a promise of every person is equally worthy of uh, dignity and, and self-determination, as part of trying to realize that, that underpinning principle that at least you know, uh, to a large extent, I believe America was, was founded on and, and has tried to push toward um, you know, within the last 150 years, a, a true push to um, equalize, I guess, treatment of men and women under law uh, went underway. Um, but the push for equality under the law only, I think, got women so far, right? And there was not a <laughs> there was not a replacement of um, here are the ways in which we have traditionally, historically codified different treatment of the sexes we're not going to do that anymore but we are going to flip it right and start re recognizing a basic premise of equality of personhood equality of opportunity equality of entitlement to dignity and yet we are not going to throw out the the idea that men and women are different we are, you know, we are going to go ahead and and articulate a new vision of what the sex differences are that that need to matter in law. We skipped okay. that step and we went okay. right from we went right from different treatment of men and women is going to always put women on the bottom. Too bad for them to. Oh, I get it. Let's treat men and women exactly the same. That'll fix it. 
And we paid no attention at all to the ways in which same treatment um, still leaves women at the bottom. Well, I don't know. I just hear an argument about drafts, I mean, is the one counter that I could hear with regards to uh, unequal uh, treatment that puts men on the bottom, at least of the cannon fodder pile. But that aside, yeah, the pursuit of equality uh, in the law toward the individual is one thing. And then there's the anti-discrimination laws. Is that a different kind of right or a different kind of mechanism of the law to pursue anti-discrimination or to, I, I guess, is it grounds for uh, no. legal action with regards to discrimination? Is that what the law does? Bro broadly speaking, I, I, I think it does amount to the same concept because if it, you know, it, all discrimination means is are you, are you treating similarly situated people differently? And then, but there should always be a second question that follows up is, is that okay or not? Is that somehow unfair, invidious, unacceptable in our society? Um, because we do distinguish among groups of people all the time, we distinguish between children and adults. Mm -hmm. uh, so similarly, should we ever be distinguishing between men and women? You know, mm -hmm. if you're going to have a draft, we need to have a conversation about whether treating all adults as equal is what should be, or whether treating men and women differently when it comes to a military draft is the appropriate social goal. Um, but those, those, those are the questions that need to happen. And so when you're talking about things like, um, you know, should, you know, who, who should have, who should be required to have a, a spouse, you know, sign off on applying for a bank loan. Well, that was discrimination that was going on that, um, Hmm. You know, that the law eventually removed. Um, so all of it can fall under, you know, the, the conceptual idea of when is it OK to discriminate in the innocuous sense of or even necessary sense of we're going to treat people differently, but it's for this reason. And maybe it's maybe it's with a goal of sometimes the only way to create truly equal opportunity or equal dignity for particular groups is to recognize the differences of those groups. Mm -hmm. And there are different ways that that shakes out. Title IX is one, one maneuver that was attempted and um, are, you've worked with Title IX, is that correct? You're pretty familiar with that. Very familiar with that. Yes, that was okay. a uh, when working in the um, education department uh, from 2017 to uh, end of the Trump administration. Um, uh, working with Title IX was 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 definitely uh, in my lane, and and so thinking through what non sex discrimination meant in different contexts, hmm. and having an opportunity to go back and look at the last 50 years of life under Title IX and see. Um, um, where a general non-discrimination rule has um, provably helped women and ways in which um, mm. the, the exceptions that are built into it, places where the law itself goes ahead and says, no, 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 you can treat men and women differently in these specific ways, um, what those rationales are based on. I mean, this is 50 years ago. So the rationales, yeah. you know, were maybe a little bit different. Rationales and then, and then just, also the outcomes too. And the outcomes, that's yeah. right. And so, may, and then trying to grapple with the, the challenges that face women and girls in particular today kind of necessitates a, a new conversation uh, in, in the legal realm about hmm. what footing, what grounding are we putting non-discrimination law uh, on. And it's probably time for some renewed analytics to go into that and not just resting on what mm -hmm. has been for the last, you know, 50 years. Yeah. Not even to mention what's going on with the gender <laughs> encroachment. There's probably That's a right. lot of other stuff going on. So, um, and we're working towards that. So thanks for allowing us to kind of, uh, kind of build some, uh, context for that. Um, what was Title IX, the rationale for it? 
And what did it eventually uh, give rise to, uh, as you've yeah. seen? So t Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, you, you notice that's when, only a few years. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. Why is it even called title and yeah. why is it called nine? <laughs> I don't even know that. <laughs> so when, when, um, when Congress... Um, when Congress passed the um, Civil Rights Act of okay. 1964, those those those, those grand pieces of legislation have various titles, var various sections of the legislation, and so they start to be referred to in shorthand. Right, okay. Title Seven of that Civil Rights Act uh, governs employment non-discrimination. Title Six governs non-discrimination, um, you know, in in uh, education programs and so forth. Um, so a few years later, just about eight years later, um, Congress passed a, a set of amendments to educational acts and the, the title the Title IX, the, the section that dealt with, um, here are all the strings of non-discrimination that we're going to attach to any education program that takes federal funding. So it could be a public school, a private school, K through 12, higher ed, anything that gets federal money now after 1972 comes attached with an obligation to not be spending federal dollars uh, in in ways that um, allow or encourage or perpetrate sex discrimination in those education programs. Okay. So there's a general rule: don't discriminate based on sex. And then the statute itself spells out several exceptions that, to our ears today, probably sound trite and surface and weird, like a statutory exception to. Um, to non-discrimination in uh, is actually in the statute, but you can go ahead and have mother-daughter dances and father-son dances. Okay, I mean, is that even important to us culturally anymore? Maybe not, but it's there because apparently it was a thing then. Um, beauty pageants, fine. You can still have your beauty pageants open only to to women. It was a lot more important then than it is now because a lot of for a lot of women that provided scholarship money at that point in time. That was the way that they that they pursued a, a higher education and so forth. Yeah. Um, there are some important exemptions built right into the statute as well, like a religious exemption. So you can, you can still be a religious school. And if you have, if you rely and look to biblical doctrine, you know, actual religious doctrine mm -hmm. that tells you that you must treat men and women differently in, in some ways, you, you can be exempt from, from title nine's application. Okay. Um, and then the regulations that the education department issued under Title IX as a statute contain some, some additional exemptions. They, you can go ahead and separate uh, girls and boys in school bathrooms and locker rooms, as long as it's separate but comparable, right? Okay, yeah. There are uh, additional exemptions like that. Physical education classes, human sexuality classes, those can be held... Uh, separately for for boys and girls in schools. Mm -hmm. This might be a stupid question, but has the law? There's a gap in the differentiation or the explicit definition of the sex differences. Does the law anywhere define the difference between sex and race within the Civil Rights Act, or is sex and race at all no. made distinct? Well, distinct in terms of. There, there are different words, right? So when the yeah. law says race, color, national origin, you know, like it, like in the Civil Rights Act, that's different from where that act says because of sex. So I, I mean, so different okay. words are used. Yeah. None of those categories are defined. Okay. It it they you know all of those categories were it was taken at, at face value that we would know. What, what we were all talking about. Yeah. Okay. And because I just, I asked that because um, in an alternate timeline, maybe there's this push for some sort of racial fluidity and uh, people identifying into another race in order to mm -hmm. reap the benefits or in order to be placed in, um, but, but that it doesn't necessarily map on, but it's just gender as a category is upsetting the sex uh, categories. Uh, there's nothing with regards to race that would stop that just as there's nothing with regards to sex that could stop that. No, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be a, a stop to it. And the other interesting thing that, that I've noticed through, through my 
policy and legal work around discrimination law is the extent to which is it really a good thing or is this has this been a stumbling block that uh, at least in the US we have we have always apparently written our civil rights non-discrimination laws um so that they apply to the entire category of the characteristic we're talking about. So in other words, we don't write a law that says, don't treat women more punitively than you treat men in similar circumstances. We say, we write a law that says, don't discriminate because of sex. So that leaves it open for men to claim the benefit of non-discrimination under that law as much as women. So the law itself, does not end up recognizing expressly the 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 group of people that have the characteristic that motivated the need for this law to begin with. And and that is the same with race or color or national origin. When we use those phrases in law, it on its face it applies to color, ethnicity, mm-hmm. you know, race, national origin of of any variety, not just um, not just for the groups with with that characteristic uh, that were you know suffering socially that kind of motivated the the law to mm-hmm. begin with. But if we if we started to go about it another way, then at a certain point when equality of outcome is reached, then there's no way for it to not keep on going, right? So uh, just the white male who you're speaking to now could be seen as not, um, not protected characteristics. If I, if you can't discriminate based on my race, then you can't. But if you can, because a black woman in, uh, would have a different outcome or a different origin Mm -hmm. than me. Um, it it just gets really tricky and and, and you see how it, plays out because people don't even understand what a protected category is. They think that the underclass will be the protected category, not just the class itself or the category itself. Yeah, it, it, it is complicated and it is, it is hard to, um, it is hard, I think, to make those calls when you are, when you're writing legislation in the midst of your own social moment and you're trying, I, I would think you're aiming to, to write it, to stand a test of time. I mean, maybe not literal eternity, but you want it to kind of last a while and stand a test of time. Um, and so can, are you foreseeing, you know, like you say that, well, we're going to, we're going to pass a law like this precisely so that within a decade or two, let, you know, we're going to hope that, the the uh, level of equal opportunity has has actually materialized to such a point that if we were trying to write a law 20 years from now, we wouldn't need this law. Uh, So it's it's difficult Hmm. to write for your own time and for what you're hoping to benefit from what you're doing and predict how that's going to settle in and be used in, you know, in a new in a new era in the future. Yeah. Um, you know, like when it comes a to target kind of thing, it is, it is. And when it comes to, uh, <laughs> sex, for example, um, it, it, it's hard to say that we've, um, done ourselves a lot of favors. Um, if, if we have not acknowledged in law, uh, that the that that material differences between the sexes provide, at least in some scenarios, a a, a non reciprocal, one way need for for women to have certain accommodations, such as such as um, a sporting category that is just for women, um, even if there was no a comparable category that's men only if it was an open category you know and a women's category that goes against the grain actually of a lot of equality law right because Hmm. at most you're supposed to keep things so equal that if they're separate they they have to be comparable for each sex we've not done a great job at articulating in law that Hmm. um when it comes to when it comes to sex the differences between males and females there are a lot of scenarios where women need our own thing but men may not need their own comparable thing. Mm-hmm, 
And when it comes to school funding, uh, I, I remember, I don't know which book it was by Jonathan Haidt, but he brought that up. He brings up some uh, applications of, of, the, uh, of the law that are kind of just odd when it shakes out because men's sports in the college setting actually uh, brings the college a lot of money because it's treated mm -hmm. differently and it, it, it's just treated differently. And then to balance that out, they, they then fund female uh, sports um, that don't have the same kind of return. And then if, if the female sport is like kayaking or something like that, then the, there has to be a male kayaking team, but the males right. end up the males end up having to work their asses off just to get the funding for that. And the women are set up, but it, cause yeah. you're just trying to equalize things and yep. playing this kind of shell game with uh, dispensation of, of the resources. When yeah. we get to something like punitive, um, the punitive aspect of the law, um, I, I, I'm, I don't know. So I have to phrase this as a question. Are women necessarily, as severely punished as men are with regards to the law. If a, if a woman murders her husband, is she, generally speaking, um, all things being equal, given the same punishment as a man is given if he uh, kills his wife and it, it, they're both found guilty and the evidence is the same? Over, over time, yeah. are men not kind of treated a little bit more punitively than women or harshly than women? I think that I think that you I think that it you you have to it's hard I think it's hard to make a, a generalized answer yeah. to that I think that yeah. if you break it out a little bit it's going to be a little of each I think that um, if you look at let's say non take take out d domestic violence incidents for yeah. for a moment and just look at murder there are so many more murders committed by men than by women that I I'd have a hard time thinking that. You, you can draw too many conclusions about overall are women's sentences harsher um, or or lack or more lax than than those of men. If you look at domestic violence situations, um, you know there 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 probably is um, data to support the idea that um, that in in some ways um, women are are treated more harshly um, mm. in the in the criminal justice system. I think the the number of women that are being swept up in the criminal justice system over the mm. last couple of decades, I mean, it's gone up several fold. Why? Um, it, I mean, it has across demographics, but um, mm. you know, there we have not made much progress in in, um, in terms of general criminal justice reform. And over criminalization, you know, that mm. tends to fall hardest on certain groups. Um, but the, yeah, the number the number of women um, imprisoned um, is is on the rise, and um, used to be such a such a small minority that um, it does that have it, something to do with like drug laws? Is that why or drugs is part of it? And um, that there are a, a lot of women are in. Um, are in prison for accessory type crimes. And that's an area where I think you, you could argue that women are being treated more harshly than their counter than their male counterparts. They're more likely to get swept up with harsh sentences for accessory type. Which charges. means being tertiarily being, involved in that's right. Uh, yeah. Some transaction or yeah. drive by or something like that. Yeah. The women's prisons, are they as harsh or uh, are they comparable to men's prisons with regards to the severity? Generally, no. I mean, I think there there's a qualitative difference. There, there are historically um, such, um, so many fewer women than men to be incarcerated that, um, for example, just just by necessity almost, you know, there may only be one or two women's um, institutions uh, in a state. And so hmm. it's much more likely that a women's prison is going to be of, uh, you know, have, have a mix of security levels, the violate, the underlying criminal offense that got you, that got you there 
you know, could range from from low to high in terms of severity. And you're all going to be imprisoned in the in the same facility as women. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whereas with men, you know, there are so many more facilities because you have to accommodate so many more people that you can you can afford to build out and have minimum Mm -hmm. security up to maximum. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the issues with with men transferring in, of course, is that that automatically changes. So here, here we're getting to uh, your what, what you're working on now. How many uh, women's prisons are there in California? Do you, do you know off the top? Just of your two. Head? There are only two in two. the entire state of, yeah. uh, and are they overflowing or are they? They're uh, they're over overflowing. Most prisons are, okay. but yeah. um, there there are um, you know cells that are designed for four people are already accommodating eight people. That oh, okay. kind of thing. Wow. Okay. And is one in North California, one in South or something like that? Okay. And what has begun to happen is that males are being transferred into female prisons. That's what's been going on. When did that start happening? So far? Uh, Yeah. Like a lot of, like several states um, in the U.S., there had been some individualized decisions about transfers of males into the women's facilities for, you know, going, going back a number of years. Um, but, but a state law took effect in January of, of 2021 that for the first time uh, formally legally gave uh, male offenders the right to choose where they wanted to be housed. Okay. Um, that's, and- that's a new thing. Okay, uh, so that law, how is that phrased that men can yeah. choose where they get to go? Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't single out men, of course. That, that that's my that's my spin on it and the impact that's, of it. But, yeah, that's but the, the law itself yeah. says does say that um, everybody every inmate coming into the the correction system is going to be asked how they identify. Uh, do they you know what is their gender identity and do they identify as transgender? non-binary or intersex so if they and male and f- you, you still get to choose male and female or do you have to be non-binary <laughs> so it, the way that the law wait you can identify as intersex yes like, wait, yes what it's spelled out <laughs> you're not it's, supposed it's, to be <laughs> i know it's awful it there's so much God. wrongness going on here it's it's pretty insane but the, okay so it's so a law uh it, it yeah, you know, whether you're a male or female offender, you you are all given the ability to speak up and say, "I identify as," and the the three special identities are okay. transgender, non-binary, intersex. Okay. And, and then, if you identify as any of those, then the law gives then the law says that the uh, Department of Corrections must refer to you by your preferred, you know, name, pronouns, honorifics. That's one okay. part. And wait, must, wait, wait, honorifics, mm-hmm. like you can declare yourself a doctor. <laughs> you can identify as a doctor and then they have to call you a doctor. You have to be referred to um, in, in a manner that uh, up, up, upholds your, yeah, your, your dignity and your, yeah. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Thanks, California. Okay. Uh-huh. Clown world. So, okay. So, y- y- and the second ma- important part is that the uh, of the rights that are given to anyone who claims one of these three identities is the mm-hmm. right to um, to state their housing preference. Do they want to be housed in a, a men's facility or a women's facility? And that and that request must be granted unless. <laughs> Very, very, very narrow set of circumstances are met by the Department of Corrections, which is that they can document an individualized security or management concern. But you would think, oh, well, all right, that's going to screen out a lot. No, because specifically in the law, that does not include taking into account as any kind of factor um, the inmates um, physical characteristics, genitalia. Um, crimes. History well, crime? that's interesting. It doesn't say background of crimes, but what it does say might be even worse. I I argue in our, it, um, and I think it does take that off the table because what it does say is is that those security and management concerns cannot cannot be about any factor 
that is that is also present in the facility that you that the inmate wants to transfer to. It's so broad and vague, but absolutely it could cover something like, hey, is the male who wants to transfer, does, does he have a mental illness that we should be concerned about that might pose an extra safety risk to women? Can't really ask about that if, if mental illness is a factor present in the women's facility already. Same with criminal offense um, in your background. If there are any sex offenders or violent offenders already present in the women's population, then I would read that statute to say, well, you got to X out that factor altogether. Then that can't be something that's taken into account as a reason not to make this transfer. Okay. 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 Um, there has to be a reasoning behind it because it doesn't make sense and it's so gameable. So do you understand the rationale of why they would put that exception that is not an exception in? I don't know. Can you help yeah, me? Yeah. I mean, the, the steel man that the yeah, the steel, the steel man is that is, is, is two levels. One is that we have, um, many years worth of data to show that, um, men who identify in this way. And for now, let's please take non-binary and identity as intersex off the table. That's a new development, but the argument goes, we've got many years worth of data that, that prove that men who identify as transgender are subject to extra vulnerability at the hands of other men in prison. Yes. So we've been searching for lots of years to find a way to better protect men who identify as transgender when they are imprisoned. So one way to do that is get them out of the men's prison altogether. Okay. Second important rational rationalization for for doing things this way is it's built into the the title of the law it's about it's about the uh dignity and safety and um agency of people who identify um in these special ways okay and okay. It, you know what else does that mean except agency. validation it's not enough to um yeah it's not enough to to separate them out for their own safety. It, it's more validating to let them choose. If you're, you know, we're going to pretend that we still have a sex separated system, and then everybody gets to choose where they feel more comfortable. That's going to really validate their identity and their dignity. Okay. All right. That, that's, here. that's the steel man, and it's 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 hard to even get through it. But I think that is the steel man. It, it, it requires, I think, absolute blindness to the impact, but, but that is the steel man of it. Let's protect them from being attacked themselves and um, but if let's it, make them feel really, really validated about okay. their inner identity. So the dignity of the trans-identifying criminal, is it... Is criminal the right word? There's probably another yeah. word. It, offender is used offender. a lot. Okay. So the dignity of the trans-identifying offender who is booked is, is so in need of protection that we will shuffle off the dignity of the fairer sex uh, and, and put, subjugate the fairer sexes. I'm sorry. I know that's not the right word using that purpose but women's dignity is means less yeah. than the dignity of the trans identified uh offender so the trans identified offender can go into the female space and probably have a material advantage physically and perhaps statistically just statistically mm -hmm. um more likelihood of committing a crime or being violent Mm -hmm. And so the women can't identify out of the, the women have nowhere to identify into that, that would preserve their dignity and their right. agency, the female offenders. And that is just not looked at or argued about. I mean, can you even argue about that? Um, to the law? Well, that's what we're trying. Right. I mean, okay. I, I, I think now we, we have, we have to start 
we have to start demanding to have that discussion i i you know through law through okay. litigation yeah. because we tried having that discussion when laws like this were were being proposed uh, and when they were in bill form and then they were voted on and then they were signed off on by governors and at, but at no stage um ha has there been any successful rollback i mean even before filing this lawsuit specific to California, you know, demand letters and, and pleadings for slow this down, meet with us, hear out women, you know, just, just went nowhere. So, so there's, were there no answers, were there arguments uh, against uh, these uh, protestations? The, the, the answer, I mean, one example is that the, um, the state legislator most responsible for sponsoring this particular bill all the way through. Um, his name is uh, Scott Weiner, and at a town hall just you know a few months ago, yes, we're passing on on the the name. Um, when pushed by you know it was an open town hall, so when pushed by women on this particular question. Um, you know, it was very much a, a mantra response. I'm so proud of what we've done to honor the dignity and, and uh, autonomy and, and uh, you know, really uphold the rights of, of transgender people here in California. It was, it was okay. there was no um, tackling of any sense of we we believe we've upheld good things for this group. But you're telling me that it's at a direct cost. Yeah. Bad things happening to another group that just five years ago we really cared about. Okay. Yeah. That that's just that's the the biggest question. Like that. There's no even recognition of the the cost. No, I mean not even in not even in the, the very practical uh, harsh terms. Like you're in the context of prison what do you do about sex between men and women and pregnancy I isn't it not a great thing to create an environment of pregnancy in prison what do you do with that and and how how did that not get taken into yeah. account there's a Q&A on the Department of Corrections website that says, um, you know, isn't pregnancy in prison going to be an issue? Oh, we, we considered it throughout this whole process. It's been but that's it. There's no explanation of what was considered or how it was decided not that it just won't be a problem. The, the answer is just, of course, we considered it. And sex in prison is always, you know, against the rules. O okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. And OK. So, oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, okay. So <laughs> phenomenal stuff. Just like, just reacting to that on an emotional level, we could go on and on about that because it's very saucy stuff. But when you try to nail down, how do we reverse this? Mm -hmm. You come to the question of what is sex? And then you find, oh, yeah. we don't, the law itself yeah. is kind of blind to that. Yeah. We don't have a great um, foundation that explains legally, for for example, in this context, why do we have separated prisons based on sex to begin with? Yes, it hasn't always been the case. You know, for for a while, early early on, we just you know the, the the few women who were convicted of something they were just tossed in wherever, and we kind of started seeing a problem with that, and so okay. You know, by by the the early mid 1800s we we had figured that out a little bit and had had started okay. segregating women from men when when women were were convicted of of public offenses um, were, was there have you found reasoning that established those sex separated prisons yes and there um it, it was See, this is all happening against a backdrop um, similar to general non-discrimination laws or giving women more equal rights. Um, the separations that were happening were either were either motivated by preserving stature for men at women's expense, or the things that weren't had a, I think a. a quite quite a tinge of benevolent sexism 
Um, so yes, it's true that women are weaker, let's say in a, in a physical sense, but, but a lot was packed into viewpoints like that, um, where th there was a lot, I think, uh, of conflation between situations where women need to be, um, separated from men for our own safety or dignity mm -hmm. and letting that not quite be articulated that way. And instead, um, it, you know, the justifications uh, were, were more of a, um, the, the weaker sex, yeah. sec second class. Yeah, the fairer sex. So yeah, you, yeah, get, you get yeah. back at me. I'm sorry for the fairer sex. Yeah. I, fairer doesn't mean weak. Though. And, Just, and not, so not surprisingly, what's very, very interesting. If you look at segre sex segregation of prisons, by the 70s and into the 80s and into the 90s, we were already starting to chip away at the foundation of keeping prisons separated by sex. Lots of planting of law review articles and, and um, legal analysis was, was already starting to happen that was questioning, why are we, why are we separating based on sex anyway? I mean really aren't e men and women equal now so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and a lot of the and the surface justification for questioning it was was think were things like um there are so few women's facilities um so many more men's facilities resource distribution is unequal men's prisons have better programming women get taught how to cook and so still and that's so sexist and men get taught how to you know have a trade like you know, repairing cars or whatever, right? And so there was a lot of identification of of historical traditional sexism yeah. that was still underpinning to some degree, you know, the dynamics of, of how men and women were treated. And so the answer to that was starting to become just don't separate based on sex anymore. Maybe just separate based on a offender level, you know, of dangerousness mm. or something. But but don't don't bother separating anymore because you want women to have all the equality and access to all the things that that men get in prison. And there yeah. were the counter suits the other way too by men who looked over at women's prisons before gender was the issue and said, "Oh, well, wait a minute, you have a nicer situation going on there. You live in more of a housing style." a communal housing style rather than a true lockdown. I, I, I want that over there. Mm -hmm. Most of those were thrown out both ways, frankly. Um, the legal based on what? Based on saying there are so few women in prison that it's hard to call imprisoned women and imprisoned men similarly situated enough to judge that the state is illegally treating them differently. Okay. In terms of resources and programming and, and outward things like that. Okay. And I mean, what, what gets overlooked in that is er, what's interesting then is that now we find ourselves um, feminists and, and women who are, are seeing the problems with, with a complete evisceration of women only spaces. We're, we're, we're identifying, Oh, okay. We, we want the spaces. Maybe we need, better clarity and analysis on why okay. than we've yeah. ever had to lay out legally before, yeah. but we want the result that we've always had, even if for differently articulated reasons. Okay. And, and because it, now I think we're, we're willing to have a conversation that we weren't willing to have, um, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, which is, which are things like the truth is women in prison are more likely to be, mothers who are motivated to stay on good behavior and get out and reunite with their kids yeah. and what women need in prison in order to have the best chance of real rehabilitation is look does look different than the resources and training and environment that men might need to give them the best shot at, at rehabilitation okay and that's not sexist just to to explore that well or at least it doesn't depends on what you mean by sexist but right. yeah um negatively uh discriminatory is sexist but it is basically sexist or discriminatory just because it's the it's the that's kind of how do how do we talk about sex differences yeah. what they are and why they might 
be meaningful. That that conversation needs to be happening now in a in a way it hasn't ever happened before. One um of my recent guests who's a phenomenal uh legal scholar, Erica Bakioki. I don't know yeah. if you saw that episode or if you've mm-hmm. uh heard of her work. Um her and also Mary Harrington, who's not a lawyer, she's also British, so what does she know about anything? Anyways, I'm kidding. Um, they begin to argue about the law is written for men by men, and a lot of just the key concepts of what it is to be an individual is not mm-hmm. from a female perspective, specifically with regards to the concept of care and motherhood, and how motherhood in and of itself is a it's a different thing that's not really conceptualized within liberal modern law. Mm-hmm. Is that where things need to go to, uh, to understand uh, or to get the law to understand what it is to be a woman? You have to drill down into motherhood. You have to drill down into not just the physical characteristics of weakness and fertility, but everything that goes along with the reality of being a woman, mm-hmm. especially a woman with regards to procreation and then raising children and all the just the just the idea of an individual in according to Erica and Mary, um, if, if you read what they're trying to say or if I'm trying to understand what they're saying is that the relationship between the mother and the child is not a one individual and another individual and property, it doesn't even, you know, individual rights and property rights don't really, Mm -hmm. don't really match down there. So I I know that's a broader question, but when we begin to start to conceptualize the woman, we have to understand that that conceptualization will have consequences um, that go, you know, again, that moving target thing and what, how is it going to disrupt or how, do we need to completely reframe the law or begin to get ready to reframe the law with regards to how it treats individuals? Um, once we start to define women as mothers and as, uh, you know, different than men. So where do we start to define woman or how do you think is the best way to begin to cement the difference between the sex? So what is a man? What is a woman? Yeah. And that would be, that that would be a pretty new new project um, of the law because so it hasn't happened yet, which is just yeah. phenomenal. That that's just it, never it's, we've we've uh, we, we've it's we've so never weird. never tried to tackle that. Wow, we've never had to we've never had to define sex under the law. We just under but but then we didn't need to articulate um, the meaningfulness or translation into civic life of being a woman versus being a man because we jumped right into um, strict equality as, as the legal vision. And so we didn't, we didn't need to explore what would and should civic life be structured as if we are taking into account, um, you got to sex differences is tricky, right? Because it's about generalizations. And so it's hard to, it, it, this is a new conversation. It, I think it needs to happen. And it, it, it has to somehow hopefully happen in a way that, um, it, in a way that acknowledges and, and give some validity and, and uh, recognition to generalizations, because that's what sex differences are in terms of anything, um, any projection, any any cultural projection of because female, then this. It's yes. always going to be just a generalization. Yes. So how do you yes. leave room enough to respect and not try to drag down women who are going to fall outside of that generalization. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, it, okay. Specific to motherhood. If we tried to have a conversation about better building structural recognition of motherhood into, um, into our systems, institutionally, legally, how do we do a better job? Well, we got to do it somehow in a way that, that fully um, allows for, not marginalizing women who are going to 
reject that, who don't fall under that generalization of what it means to be a woman is, you know, motherhood is part of what it means or, mm-hmm. or part of the inevitable life track uh, of being yeah. a woman. Yeah. Um, you know, I think some like maybe Mary Harrington might argue that part of part of the challenge is that um, there have been some aspects of feminism that have pushed so hard against compulsory X, Y, and Z, like don't compel women to be mothers or be heterosexually married or whatever. We're going to push hard against compulsory things for women, but it's left it's left um, large segments of women um, who do fit the generalizations that flow yeah. from some sex differences feeling marginalized and or just their needs are not being spoken to and then they don't right. get the representation that they need within law let's just say or uh, other public policy yeah. factors yeah um but it's hard to but <laughs> and then the current moment we're in right now it is driven i think by an urgency around the the gender debate because i don't know that you can have those conversations with any kind of productivity or rationality behind them um, uh, until and unless you're, you're starting from a place of, of unified, let's build something on material reality again. You, you've got to recognize that women are a sex class and then we can have a new debate mm. in a different way than we've had before about, you know, okay, we've got to hash it out all over again. If we recognize women, you know, as as uh, as a sex class based on maleness and femaleness, is that determinism? Is that essentialism? Well, no, because blah, blah, blah. But you have to start there. <laughs> you have to have the foundation of recognizing um, this. This is objectively what it what maleness and femaleness is. They are different things. They are immutably different things and individuals immutably fall into one or the other category, um, not of their own choice. That has to return to being the foundation before we can even start talking about how to kind of shift and maybe make some of the legal treatment and recognition of men and women um, more productive and more toward human flourishing, I think, than, Hmm. than just the strict equality approach that hasn't really done a whole lot for us. It started the ball ball rolling. Yeah. Right. So going away from that strict equality point of view, which gave us a certain amount of gains has been the progressive project. As I see it, the, with regards to race, uh, the Civil Rights Act, uh, you know, there's the slavery <laughs> stuff that w- went on, which is not good at all, which led to a lot of different problems. But then there's the Jim Crow stuff, and then there's the Civil Rights Act, and the approaching of race and attempting to institute equality with regards to race uh, was one path. And I'm sure that that is connected to equality of women and other kinds of categories. And I'm thinking that we, I wonder if we already understood that different religions are treated differently and are at least honored by the law up to probably criminal activity. Like there's certain religions that can't just claim that human sacrifice is something that that puts them Mm -hmm. beyond the law. So I don't know how the law, uh, where the law draws the line on, on religious yeah. belief, but we already know that different religious communities have different beliefs and we are, the law can probably treat them differently or interact with them differently just on the basis of maybe in prison giving uh, access to you know, halal food and kosher food mm-hmm. uh, as a part of, uh, you know, going along with that. So we know that the law is capable in a liberal society of treating different groups differently and holding that but i guess with religion people kind of identify into that so if you can identify into Mm -hmm. gender it's not the same as identifying in into religion so religion is more porous and not as immutable as sex and race is a different thing but race also paved the way for this notion of equality anyways Mm -hmm. i'm going to finish up what i was trying to say is that the civil rights act 
came to be, and then we did a bunch of work. And then in the last 20, 10 years, critical social justice via critical race theory is trying to re invigorate that project and to say that it's not enough to be equal in front of the law. We have to dismantle the law because the law is in and of itself racist, right? Or, or attacking the law based on its uh, systemic racism and stuff. So the, the progressive project is progressing towards beyond equality already in that it's it's called equity yeah. now they're they're no longer looking for equality they're looking for equity which is basically uh retributive redistribution based on race in order to you know according to N. ibram kendi we have to dim- discriminate in the present to solve the past and to solve the future we need to discriminate again so it's no longer about anti-discrimination with regards to race with regards to sex it's completely different it's just uh just we're going to tear apart the entire category. Yeah. And, and so resolving that is one to attack that ideology or to figure out how to uh, encapsulate this trans non-binary and intersex category. Now that it's there in the law, you have to somehow encapsulate that and give it a bound in the law so it doesn't destroy everything or it doesn't erode everything. Right. Cause yes. can you just take mm-hmm. it out? Can you take yes, that? Yes, like I mean you, sh- you should. It's it's uh, it's okay. almost it's it's almost ridiculously difficult to um to take out anything in law yeah, that that's, is viewed right. as a right. Um it's awfully difficult. Um so the the, the question is ha- have have these laws um just jumped a shark so badly that that we'll actually be willing to do that to actually just erase it right out of law. Like, there's no Is there place a precedent for, for any of that happening, I guess? Um, it's hard to think of one now. It really it really is, but we've never but we've never done this before. We've never tried to make um, something so uh, subjective, non-defined, encroaching on other things that are objective and defined and, okay. and and given it the veneer of this is just the next legitimate non-discrimination legal protection of a vulnerable group item okay so we've never done this before um but i i, I think it is possible that you know that there could as much as there's been a a a kind of a collective false consensus. I think it is possible that there's a collective wake up call from it at some point enough to say, huh, you know what? It's weird to have a word like gender flux written into legislation. It's weird. Why why did we do this? Is that one word? Is there a hyphen at least? Gender Gender flux? (laughs) Gender queer. I mean, it's, it's, it's weird that we're doing this, that we're writing it into statute. Might even call it queer. um, Theoretically (laughs) speaking. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. So we know that religions can be treated differently under the law, just with diet. So we know that there are exemptions, religious exemptions within law with regards to prison treatment, Um, you know, providing certain spaces for prayer and stuff like that. And I'm sure that the law encapsulates that or or gives it a bounds. You can, you can, there's certain things that you can, the law will change based on your Mm -hmm. belief system, but no further. You know, we won't erase your crime, you know, right? So the law should be able to say gender is a belief system. If you believe that you're intersex, which I can't believe that they even put that (laughs) in there. If you believe that you're transgender, if you believe that you're non-binary, we will afford you a certain amount of, you know, we'll give you a certain amount in order to facilitate that, but no more, right? We're not going to say, okay, well, because... Islam in, in its holy text says that it has to kill all infidels is the Muslim in prison should be completely allowed to kill all the Christians. Right. I mean, and that, that yeah. I'm just going all the way. So there has to be the basis. If we translate it from this gender stuff into religion and still mm-hmm. maintain uh, bounds for it so that it's not yeah. actually infringing on the rights of other people. I can't believe that they don't even think about the infringement of the rights of other people. Isn't that like a basic precept in the law? I don't know. Or just a cultural precept yes. that, you know, your, your rights end it would be. mine begin or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. But there, but the, I, I mean, that's, 
that's the the beauty of critical theory of all varieties, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's it's a it's a very twisted form of postmodernism that prides itself on not maintaining even internal coherence, even internal logic or you know there there's no there there's no seeking of of um making sure that you're putting forward positions that are non-contradictory kind of a fundamental staple of a valid position um okay but, does but, does the law do does the law anymore. define validity of position? I mean, could could critical no, theory even a... just erode the very logic of the law because the law hasn't yes. defined logic? Yes, I mean that, that when you unwind it that far, wow. yes. If you go back to common law, I mean, there's no definition. There's nothing that codifies it, but but it's a it, it's just a it's just a principle that. That yeah. law is is based on is we are going to appeal to rationality as in logic, as in evidence, as in Reason. objectivity, yeah. uh, as in non-contradiction. You can't say, you know, the light was red and the light was green, and we're going to just hold that as our conclusion in this case. No, you don't do that. Um, but that's that's if you if you break down and sweep away those underpinnings of rationality itself um then hmm. then there, there's no conversation to be had it's just the whims and and feelings and dictates oh, of yeah wow and no it's and, and and to your to your point i'm i lean toward <laughs> this being the best we can do solution is to start shoving uh more and more um of this ideology into how we handle religion as a framework. Um, it's funny, okay. I, have a, I, have a, I have a brother who is a devout Orthodox Christian, which is, is new to our family. Greek. It's not how we grew up uh, and were raised, Russian, American, Greek, um, but yeah, or all the Orthodox Christianity traditions. Um, and he's, he's very offended at the thought that, uh, you know, a a belief that sprang up kind of out of nowhere, you know, in the, the mutability of sex. And of course, you know, you're seeing it spread into, you know, trans everything, right? You can be trans abled, you can be trans racial, you can be trans Age. species. So the, the, mm. the idea that, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a frog or, you know, or you're 12 it, it is, or right it is uh or you're a 12 year old frog is even you with know, a the missing idea, leg that's right the, the idea that you would even give that the the imprimatur of the respectability of saying we will treat that the same yeah. as a a uh, sincerely held religious conviction is deeply offensive yeah I, i'm not sure what else to do with it at this point frankly i, well, I, mean, I mean even <laughs> even atheists are, are offended that their uh that atheism is seen as a belief because they, they yeah. think that they're beyond belief, but that's how the law right. treats it. That's yeah. it's precedent, but it also makes sense. But I guess we could try to figure out another way to doing it. But aside from religion and race, I don't know how else you're going to combat sex once the critical, critical theory stuff gets a hold of it. Yeah. And, and I really do think that people, if people are not paying attention to the gender stuff and the critical race stuff, they have no idea how far this thing can go into completely eroding logic and completely it can yeah. it can it, and it won't stop until it does yeah it won't stop until it does so the the i mean so we need to cling to these we need to cling to reality wherever we can and sex yeah. is a very important place to do that um for the safety of women but also for the for real for the sake of reality yeah right that's right yeah and so you know with that said Although it's never been clear enough under U.S. law what counts as a religion, you know, we, we've got we've got two pillars that deal with religion um, and rights. We, we've got free exercise of religion on the one hand, saying we mm-hmm. will protect your ability to believe and to a large extent act on your beliefs. That's where you're talking about the only limits, you know, the limits to that are going to be these 
neutral, generally applicable laws. They're not intended to stop you from practicing your religion, but we've got secular reasons for having these laws. And so you, you're going to have to abide by them, uh, mm-hmm. e- even if you would prefer not to because of your religion. But within that umbrella, there's a lot of freedom there to not only believe, but say your beliefs and and practice your beliefs and do things because of your beliefs. Um, on the other on the other hand, we have we have the rule about don't establish a, a, a government religion, um, and that both of those mm-hmm. things are now implicated um, mm-hmm. if we allow laws to be mm-hmm. openly. Mm-hmm boldly premised on nothing other than the belief that it's a real thing that sex and not having a sex um, are, are just a matter of inner identity and yeah, self, inner identity self feeling. I mean, w- determination. Even the, when that, the law that's a tries belief to system. Yeah. They, it, in the law, they say what is whenever they do define gender, it's usually a internal feeling, which is synonymous with belief. At least yes. in Washington laws that you, I've you seen, would, you would think so. And so, the government enforcing, let's just say, pronoun laws in law is establishing a religion. I, I think there's, I think there's an argument to that. I, that's. Yeah, it's one of the arguments we're raising against the prison law is you, you, mm. you can't compel um, yeah. and and yeah. have how you are addressing, treating, and housing everybody premised on this belief system and nothing else um, w- without that veering into, huh, now it's the government... Uh, establishing a belief system, calling it the truth and punishing anybody who doesn't pay homage to that truth. And the, and the critical theorists will come back at you and say, well, the, the government is a religion. It's an ideology. Logic is just as much a belief as queer theory is. So then the government's established religion is just reason and enlightenment, which is a white supremacist system that's cis heteronormative and, and needs to be combated by this better belief system. I mean, it, it's so screwed. We're so screwed. <laughs> Unless we can cling together. So with yeah. regards to practical applications, you have um, practical applications. You have, you've written, a, what have you done? Like, is this a brief or a, a suit? What, what, yeah, or? a legal complaint sets out Okay. Yeah, you know, all of the constitutional claims uh, of why the California law that allows all this right now should be declared okay. unconstitutional. And so this isn't like a class action lawsuit where you are fighting on behalf of specific individuals being women in prisons. It's for the law. So if you can get this in there, then they have the right to start to sue if you can get this into law, right? They have well, some sort of recompense or protection. Yeah, so... Um, there are individual incarcerated women who signed up to be plaintiffs in, in okay. this lawsuit. So it is, okay. it is on okay. behalf of individuals. Okay. Um, but asking That's for a- the entire law to be struck down. Okay. And uh, that should be resolved in about 10 days or something. Like that, three day <laughs> right. <trial>. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Battling through litigation is uh, not, not the fun way to go about any of this. Um, okay. it, it takes a long time and, um, yeah. based on where the needle is right now, societally, there's a lot of evidence that the judiciary was, was captured quickly and, and effectively. Uh, so I, I think we're in for a long haul of, okay. of needing to continue starting litigation on many fronts, probably for many years. Okay. Um, so when you say that the judiciary is captured, you're probably indicating or implying that they can just keep on throwing this out of court and you're going to keep on having to appeal and rewrite it. And how many times can you appeal indefinitely? You can keep on appealing or they say in a way, I think there are ways that, that, you know, you legitimately can do that. There there are lots of people kind of perennially affected. And so you can just keep circulating, honing arguments, um, drawing different panels. It just, you got to keep trying. 
And you said many fronts. So women's prison yeah. is one front. What's the other front? The, the, probably the most active front of the gender war in litigation is women's sports. That's yeah, probably okay. the, yeah. the, the most active litigation front of all of this or, or yeah. you know, some, some case. Well, you know what? I take that back. Just this year, I think it's probably being overtaken now by um, suits over, over pronoun policies. Because the, the free speech um, aspect of that, especially in schools where you've now got um, both teachers and students that um, are, are finding themselves compelled to at least pretend or okay. profess to believe, right? So that, okay. that's catching up quickly, I think, in terms of where the litigation okay. is happening. And then right First. behind that is, um, um, is the, the medical aspect of the transgender movement. Meaning what a de detransitioner regret? Meaning stuff, parents or? starting to sue uh, both schools and and therapists for putting their child onto a path that uh, may start okay. with social transition but leads very very quickly into medicalization. Um, I think you're starting to see detransitioners weigh in, maybe not bring their own suits here. I think they are bringing their own suits in, in places like Australia, but at least here they're yeah, organized okay. enough now to weigh in on court litigation um, to, to provide a cautionary voice to say, you know, providing public funding, for example, for youth transition services may, may not be the best idea. Okay. Wow. Wow. So freedom of speech. So that's the first amendment you're working with. Uh, what are you, what is the prison? Is that like, yeah. uh, where in the general area of the law is it called yeah. is it a title or an amendment? Or you guys got like a yeah. special bill out there? What are you working yeah, so with? So the, with the prison, we're arguing that a law like this um, is cruel and unusual punishment, punishment. that's covered okay. by the eighth amendment. Um, okay. It's a, you know, under the first amendment, you've got freedom of speech, freedom of freedom to petition the government is implicated, okay. uh, free exercise of religion mm -hmm. and uh, establishment of religion. Yeah. Uh, then you got the equal protection clause uh, of the 14th the amendment. Yeah. Oh, 14th. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't mention sex specifically, but for decades and decades, it's been Im implied and interpreted to include yeah. sex. You can't, you shouldn't be treating people differently for no good legitimate reason on the basis of sex. This is just, it, it's mind blowing. Like the, the implications of this uh, gender ideology is not just TikTok videos and like people, no. uh, you know, demanding other people act a certain way yeah. on the internet and Twitter. It's not at all. That is no, totally it's very real. It's very real. Um, and you're in it for the long haul. So how can people support you or help you out um, or uh, get on board with this? What are some good places where they can help you or be involved in this and keep abreast of developments or yeah. get well, a reminder I mean, with, every seven years on where your suit is? Right? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm... Um, yeah. Just, yeah. Disclaimer that all, all the things I'm talking about are my own personal viewpoints as a person and lawyer and advocate, but this particular lawsuit with the prisons is um, um, the project of women's liberation front. Yeah, uh, Wolf, their acronym yeah. is WOLF. Yep. So visit their website. They now have a, a whole page dedicated to this lawsuit um, because this is um, WOLF acting as um, legal counsel with alongside me to represent these women in prison and, mm. and try to get these laws overturned. So go, go mm. through, go through Wolf's website to okay. keep, keep track of, of that effort and, and donate to Wolf for it. Yeah. So the, there's a litigation front. There's also a political front, right? So it's, it's showing up to school boards on one level, it's voting, it's, it's uh, pressuring your representative to explicitly state where they land on this issue yeah, and, and keeping them accountable or at least know where they're going to be headed with this. And in States like Washington, Oregon, and California, I mean, we're probably totally screwed, but you know, there's probably other places that we can stop it before it gets to this point. But with regards to California, it's way, way past the point of anything other than doing what you're doing now. There's yeah. Other people in other places could probably do preventative work and save themselves the hassle of what you're doing, which is post-op, right? 
or post. I think, I, I think there's some truth to that. I think this is everywhere by now. I think it's shocking to yeah. to people um, how, how this is not even this hasn't even stopped at a you know in the U.S. at a red state blue state uh, border. Mm-hmm. It, it really hasn't. There are plenty of red states um, that that have bought into plenty of this. Um, most states didn't see this coming. And so actually very few states had legislation specifically addressing transgender issues, let's say in schools particularly. Mm -hmm. Well, that left it up to individual school districts. So even in red states, um, there are plenty of school districts that have um, put policies into place um, that that fully um, support um, social transition and um, you know, in, in the anti-bullying and LGBTQ yes. inclusion um, channels, you know, have had this stuff coming yeah. in for, for a while now. Yeah. Well, Candice, this is a amazing work that you're doing, and it's very enlightening uh, to me, and I knew nothing about the law. There's this, there's, a, there's one like old, old joke about... There's like the like philosophies arguing with uh, religion, and then law comes through and like says like I I can I'm actually the realest thing that there is. Law, law actually has uh, we don't give it the shake that it de- deserves, but uh, it's more inevitable than taxes because it provides the yeah. reasoning for them. And well, so what's on, it, so. yeah, I mean, what's interesting to me is when reality itself is being challenged, you know, exposing the the gaps in in the analytics that underpin mm-hmm. the law has been really really eye opening mm-hmm. um and i i think the best thing we can do is is treat it as a challenge and and step mm-hmm. up and and rise to meet that challenge and say okay there are gaps there are absolutely gaps in in the principles that have uh that that law is built on mm-hmm. um and but we we can actually we can actually fill those in with the, n- enough smarts and orientation and funding. <laughs> right. I'm going to end the recording. Thank you so much for joining me, Candace. Pleasure. <laughs>